Today we're going to discuss the heine borel theorem. To do so, we'll first recall some concepts. Let's say that S is a subset of the real numbers. We'll say that a point P and S is an isolated point if there exists a neighborhood of P, namely V sub epsilon naught of P, whose only point in S is P itself. We'll denote I of S as the collection of isolated points of S. We'll say that a real number P is a limit point for S if, given any positive epsilon, we can find an X sub epsilon in the intersection V sub epsilon of P with S, and X sub epsilon does not equal P. We'll denote L of S as the collection of limit points of S. We found before that S is contained in the union of the I of S and the L of S. That is, every point of S is either an isolated point or a limit point. Moreover, no point is contained in both. That is, there's no point P that is both an isolated point and a limit point. L of S is contained in S, that is, every limit point of S is actually a point of S, if and only if every Cauchy sequence in S has a limit in S. As a couple of examples, let's say that S is either the open interval from A to B, or S is the closed interval from A to B. Then S has no isolated points, and the collection of limit points of S is the closed interval from A to B. We'll recall a few more definitions. Let's say that S is a subset of the real numbers as before. The interior of S, namely S0, is the collection of points in S such that there exists a neighborhood of that point completely contained in S. We'll say that S is closed if each of its limit points is also in S. The closure of S, denoted by S bar, is the union of S along with its limit points. The complement of S, denoted by SC, is the collection of those real numbers X, such that X is not an element of S. We now had some nice properties regarding these three definitions. The interior, S circle, is an open set. The closure, S bar, is a closed set. And S is closed if and only if its complement, SC, is open. Similarly, S is open if and only if its complement, SC, is closed. We found that any closed interval from A to B is a closed set. If S sub lambda, where lambda ranges over some indexing set capital lambda, is an arbitrary family of closed sets, then its intersection is also a closed set. Similarly, if S sub lambda, where lambda ranges over a finite indexing set capital lambda, is a collection of closed sets, then the union is also a closed set. We then explained how all of this is related to the Cantor middle third set. We'll recall the construction as follows. Let C0 denote the closed interval from 0 to 1. We can now remove the middle one third of this set to find C sub 1, which is the union of the closed intervals from 0 to 1 third and then from 2 thirds to 1. In this fashion, we have a sequence of subsets C0, C1, through C sub n, defined recursively as you see here on your screen. The point is that the limit of these, the so-called Cantor middle third set, is an uncountable set. We saw last time that this Cantor middle third set is a closed set that has no isolated points. In fact, more generally, a subset of the real numbers S is said to be perfect if it is closed and contains no isolated points. Today, we'd like to introduce the concept of an open cover. We'll give the definition. Let's say that O sub lambda is a family of open sets where lambda ranges over some indexing set capital lambda. We've already seen that the union over elements in this family is also an open set. Given a subset S, we'll say that such a family is an open cover for S if S is contained in this union. Let's now say that capital theta is a subset of this indexing set capital lambda. We'll say that this set, where we range now, O lambda, where lambda is in this subset capital theta, is a subcover for S 
If S is contained in the union, we're now lambda ranges over the elements in this subset capital theta. Finally, we'll say that this set is a finite subcover if the indexing set capital theta is a finite set. Let's give a few examples of this. First, let's say that S is the real numbers. We can, we'll denote O sub lambda as the open interval from lambda minus 1 to lambda plus 1, where lambda here is any real number. Well, since any real number is contained in one of these O sub lambdas, then we see that the family of these O sub lambdas, where lambda ranges over the real numbers, is an open cover for the collection of real numbers. Next, let's say that S is the open interval, perhaps from A to B. We'll denote O sub 1 as the same open interval from A to B. Then the set consisting of just this open set is an open cover for S. In fact, this is a finite cover because there's only a finite number of sets inside of this family. Finally, let's say perhaps that S is the union of two closed intervals, the first from 0 to 1 and the second from 2 to 5. Let's denote O sub lambda as the open interval from negative lambda to positive lambda for any natural number lambda. For example, O sub 1 is just the open interval from negative 1 to positive 1. O sub 2 is the open interval from negative 2 to positive 2. In fact, we do see that this family of O sub lambdas, where lambda ranges over the natural numbers, is an open cover for this set S. In fact, we really don't need all natural numbers lambda. We can only use a handful. We actually see that if we take a look at the collection O sub 2, O sub 3, and O sub 6, this forms a finite subcover for S. Indeed, you'll see that actually S is completely contained inside of O sub 6. So actually, we could refine this even further to say that the family just consisting of O sub 6 is a finite subcover. Let's now use this concept of open covers to define the concept of a compact set. First, we want to review some definitions and some properties that we've proved up to this point. Recall that we proved the following. The following three statements are equivalent for a subset S. First, every limit point of S is an element of S. Second, every Cauchy sequence contained in S has a limit also contained in S. Third, the closure of S is just equal to S itself. We realize that any subset S satisfying either of these equivalent properties is said to be a closed set. Next, we prove this theorem by Bolzano and Weierstrass. Let's say that A is a bounded sequence. That is, there exists some capital M such that each X sub M in absolute value is less than or equal to capital M then A has a convergent subsequence B. Today we're going to prove the following that kind of combines both of these together. It's a celebrated theorem by two individuals, Heine and Burrell. It says the following are equivalent for a subset K. First, every sequence has a convergent subsequence in K, where the limit is also an element in K. Second, K is closed and bounded. Third, if there exists a family, O sub lambda, of open sets, such that K is contained in the union, then there exists a finite subset, capital theta, inside of our indexing set, capital lambda, such that K is contained in the union over lowercase lambda and capital theta. Any subset K satisfying either of these equivalent definitions is said to be a compact set. Note that the third statement is simply usually stated as every open cover has a finite subcover. This theorem, proved as stated here in 1895, is actually named after two mathematicians, the German mathematician Eduard Heine and the French mathematician Emile Borel. Hence, we typically call this theorem the heine borel theorem. Let's present a proof of this theorem. We're going to do this in four directions. We'll prove that the first statement implies the second, the second statement implies the first, 
the second statement implies the third, and the third statement implies the second. So first, let's start by proving that the first statement implies the second. That is, let's assume that every sequence, nk, has a convergent subsequence b, where the limit is also an element of k. We're going to use this to prove, statement 2, that is that k is closed and bounded. Well, let's take a look at the special case where we have a Cauchy sequence. Well, because we have a Cauchy sequence, we know that it's convergent, and therefore it has a limit. But because we're assuming that statement 1 is true, this means that its limit is an element of k by assumption. But now this is true for every Cauchy sequence, and therefore our set k must be closed, because we just proved that every Cauchy sequence has a limit in k. So it suffices now to prove that k is bounded. We'll do this by contradiction. We'll assume that k is not bounded. This means that there does not exist a capital M such that the absolute value of x is less than or equal to m for all x in our set k. But using this, we can construct a sequence of elements x sub n that gets larger and larger and larger. So let's put the sequence in a set A, and by our assumption, that is statement 1, there exists a convergent subsequence where the limit is an element of k. But every convergent subsequence is actually a bounded sequence, and you'll see now that this is the problem. We can't have a sequence that gets larger and larger, but then also have a sequence that's bounded. Hence, k must be a bounded set. Now let's go in the opposite direction. Let's prove the statement 2 implies statement 1. So let's assume that k is closed and bounded. Let's now choose any sequence A that is contained in k. Well, since k is bounded, our sequence A is bounded, and the bolzano weierstrass theorem says that there must be a convergent subsequence B. But since k is a closed set, by assumption, its limit must also be an element of k. Hence, we've just shown that every sequence containing k has a subsequence that converges to an element contained in k. Hence, statement 1 must be true. Now let's prove that statement 2 implies statement 3. We're going to assume that k is closed and bounded, and we must show that every open cover of k has a finite subcover. So let's assume by way of contradiction that we actually do have an open cover of k where we do not have a cover for any finite subset, capital theta, of our indexing set, capital lambda. Let's consider the following set. We want to consider those open intervals, v sub epsilon of p, where p is a rational number, epsilon is a positive rational number, and this open interval, v sub epsilon of p, is contained in one of our open sets, O sub lambda. Here, what we're doing is we're taking every open interval centered at a rational number p, having a rational length epsilon, and this must be contained in at least one of these open intervals, open sets, O sub lambda. Since p and epsilon are rational numbers, we see that this set capital P is a countable set. That means that we have a surjection from the natural numbers to this set capital P that sends a natural number maybe to some open set, open interval, V sub epsilon sub n, P of n. This actually means that the collection of these F of n's is a countable open cover for K. We're going to use this to form our contradiction. Let's recursively define a sequence x sub n contained in k as follows. Let's start by trying to explain where x sub 1 comes from. Well, recall that our set capital P is countable, so let's maybe take the first element of the set. Let's call this f of 1. This is some open interval contained in some open set, maybe O of lambda sub 1. Well, we know that O of lambda sub 1 cannot be an open cover for k, again because we proved that our open cover has no finite subcover, and this set O of lambda 1 would be a finite subcover for k. So that means then there's some element x sub 1 in k 
that does not lie in this open set f of 1. So let's just pick x of 1. More generally, f of n, as we move out n elements in our sequence for capital P, is contained in maybe some open set O of lambda n. Well, the set O of lambda 1, O of lambda 2, through O of lambda m cannot be an open cover for k, because remember our assumption. We're assuming that we have no finite subcover for k. So this means that there's some x sub n in k that is not contained in either of the previous f1, f2, or f of n's. Since 2 implies 1, that is, if k is closed and bounded, then we know that our sequence A has a convergent subsequence B. And we'll denote P as the limit of this subsequence, which, of course, must be an element of k. However, notice that this element P must lie in one of these open sets f of n, because as we said before, f of n must be an open cover for k. So let's say that P lies in some f of n zero. But each f of n is an open set. So if we wind through the definitions of subsequences, there exists a delta such that x sub n n is contained in f of n zero whenever n is greater than delta. However, this is a contradiction because we'll look at how we defined our sequence. x sub n n does not lie in f of n zero whenever n sub n is greater than n sub zero. So this is a contradiction. Now, let's finish things off by proving statement three implies statement two. That is, we're going to assume that every open cover of k has a finite subcover. We'll use this to prove that k is both closed and bounded. First, let's prove that k is bounded. Every lambda in k is contained in the open interval from lambda minus 1 to lambda plus 1 because, of course, this open interval is centered at lambda. So here, the collection of these O sub lambdas for lambdas in K must be an open cover for K. But by our assumption, there must exist a finite subcover where we can choose here our capital theta to consist of the finite set lambda 1, lambda 2 through lambda sub n. But now, because here we have a finite set, we just take a look at each of these subintervals, the lambda 1 minus 1 to lambda 1 plus 1, and we see that we actually do have the union to be a bounded set. We can explicitly write the bound m in terms of these lambdas. Now, we need to prove that k is a closed set. So let's assume by way of contradiction that k is not closed. This means that we can find a Cauchy sequence containing k such that its limit is not contained in k. For each lambda in k, let's denote O sub lambda as a very specific open interval. It'll be centered at lambda, but its radius, or I should say its length, epsilon sub lambda, will be chosen in a very clever way. Since it's centered at lambda, we see that again we have an open cover for k, and there must exist some finite subcover in terms of capital theta, where theta just consists of these finite numbers lambda 1 through lambda sub n. Now we're going to choose a certain distance epsilon that is small enough that will form a contradiction. On the one hand, let's try to take a look at our Cauchy sequence that we began with, capital A. Since it is a Cauchy sequence, from the way we've chosen our epsilon, there exists a delta such that xn minus p is less than epsilon whenever n is greater than delta. However, from the way that we've chosen our epsilon, we see that x sub n minus lambda is larger than each of the epsilon sub lambdas that we chose originally, where lambda here just lies in our finite set capital theta. So the whole point here is that we've chosen the O sub lambdas, where again lambda lies in our finite set capital theta, to be small enough that the elements x sub n do not lie in either of these open sets O sub lambda. This means that x sub n does not lie in our finite subcover. 
But of course, this is a problem because each of the x sub n's was in k, and therefore it must lie in our finite subcover. Here's the contradiction. So we see now that k must be a closed set, which does indeed finish off the proof. The statement 3 implies statement 2. Thanks for watching.